we will be recording today's meeting. And I'd like to just welcome back uh, to some of you. And it's also going to be exciting to see new faces on this call today. On behalf of the National Endowment for the Arts and Bayback Media, I'm here to officially welcome you to the start of this quarterly field meeting for the Independent Film and Media Arts Group, which we also refer to as the acronym of IMAG. My name is Jax DeLuca, and I'm the Director of Film and Media Arts at the National Endowment for the Arts. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a woman uh, with olive skin and dark brown hair. As a reminder for those of you who might be new to this group, IMAG is part of the Independent Film and Media Arts Field Building Initiative, which is a collaboration between the National Endowment for the Arts, Bayback Media, and all of you. And we're really excited to see this initiative grow. And we see this as a way to bring together a vast network of networks across the field to promote regional activity focused on strengthening communities and advancing equity and career sustainability for individuals working in this industry. And this work of IMAG is critically important at this juncture in our history as independent media, um, media makers, artists, and organizations, which is why we are recording today's meeting. And it will be archived on our IMAG website. And I've intentionally used that word archive because it does relate to today's topic, which is recontextualizing the canon through media arts and preservation. And today, our amazing lineup of presenters will explore the ways that film and media artists and organizations use archival materials and preservation practices to produce new work, engage their communities, and also represent vital voices and histories through media. We thought this topic would be a great way to help our field contextualize the contributions of this field in lifting up communities and also making a more inclusive and representative worldview available and accessible to the generations that come after us. And coincidentally, the timing of today's conversation comes after a recently published open letter from the newly established Archival Producers Alliance which was calling for guardrails around generative AI as a precautionary measure to protect the authenticity of historical records. So we do hope that today offers some threads of inspiration, especially as those of you working in community film and media arts are keepers of cultural records that may not exist elsewhere. And so for those of you who would like to review today's agenda and lineup of presenters, there's a link in the chat. And the agenda also includes the time markers for each session alongside the presenters and an overview of the day. Before we get into the two sessions around media arts preservation, I'm going to pass the mic over to the wonderful Brittany, who is the Associate Director at Bayback Media for some housekeeping and general information about the meeting. Great. Um, thank you, Avril, for sharing the slide. My name is Brittany Rayom. I am the Associate uh, Director of Artist Development at Bayback Media. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm happy to welcome you here today. Um, please take a moment to add your pronouns and your name to your name in Zoom. Introduce yourself in the chat with your name, your organization, your location, anything else you want to say about being here today. And please add your land acknowledgement, including land back actions in your region if you know them. Continue to use the chat throughout the day to engage your fellow community members and use the Q&A function to directly propose questions to the panelists, moderators, and the hosts. Next slide. We appreciate your presence here today. Um, please take care of yourself and take breaks as needed. There's a lot happening um, and we're just gonna go through. You won't miss too much. If you need to take time for yourself, please do. This meeting is being recorded and archived. Um, please keep your camera on as much as you feel comfortable with. It's fun to see everyone's faces. Um, while this is a two hour meeting, it will go fast and we will need to scan, stay on schedule. So we will gently let people know when their time is up. Have grace with yourself and others. We're human, we make mistakes, it's normal. And thank you again for being here. I'm gonna pass it to Paula, I believe. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Brittany. Hi, everyone. My name is Paula Smith Aragoni. I'm the executive director at BayVac Media, and I have the pleasure of serving on this team um, with my BayVac colleagues and also with the NEA team. Um, so thank you so much for being here. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and um, at BayVac, we are, uh, we sit on the Ohlone lands. Um, and uh, my uh, appearance, I, I'm, today I'm wearing glasses, um, I have light skin, I have brown hair, and it's pulled off of my face. Um, my role today is I get to introduce um, our fantastic advisory committee. And we created an advisory committee um, for the purpose of really helping us elevate the important work that we're all doing across the field, across the country, in all of our different subsectors of the work and across different types of communities. Um, we, we are very adamantly uh, trying to really raise the profile of our work. Um, sometimes it is um, a bit overlooked um, in the um, different types of art practices and, um, and also just in the general public about kind of the important role that we play laying the foundation for a lot of important artists out there, um, you know, telling important stories um, and really uh, being uh, so important to create important civil discourse, particularly in times like this when things can be so fraught. So we really are so excited uh, to have this wonderful group of folks that are joining us on this initiative. Um, and their role is really to um, help us uh, curate topics, uh, great speakers, projects, best practices, um, and, and really, yeah, just uh, kind of bring people along, also um, sharing the word with other kind of different networks. So, um, so really, really excited about this. Um, the way that we selected our advisory committee, um, we, uh, we invited uh, folks that are representatives of large networks in the media arts field um, within different subsectors. And then we also had an open call, as many of you saw, we invited folks and uh, we received some really wonderful people through that process as well. So without further ado, let me just uh, introduce them. I'm just going to introduce the folks that are here today, um, and everyone is going to take a minute just to say who you are, and then also why you're excited about being part of the IMAG initiative. So in alphabetical order, I'm going to start with Kia Brooks. Great. Thanks so much, Paula. Hi, everyone. I'm Kia Brooks. Um, my pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm an African-American woman. Um, I have diamond earrings on and my hair pushed back right now. Um, I am very excited to be a part of this group. Um, I've been at the Gotham for nine years. Um, my current role is deputy director. So I oversee all of our programming communications. I handle our strategic planning with our executive director, as well as do a lot in our development um, for the organization as well. Um, I've been a part of these IMAG calls for the past couple of years and it's just been really great to build relationships with organizations all across um, the country uh, as well as with NEA and so you know I think for the Gotham this is always just great to hear um, you know what are other people working on how can we be more supportive as an organization to the field at large um, and my, for myself personally I'm also just very passionate about community building um, in ways that we can just come together to find solutions, especially for a lot of the challenges that we see our community of film and media creators facing, especially right now. So thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be a part of this. Thank you, Kia. Um, next in our advisory committee is Sahar Driver of Color Congress. I don't believe that Sahar has been able to join yet. And if Sahar, if you're here, nope. Okay, so we're going to go to our next person, and that is... Maori Carmel Holmes of Black Star Film Fest. Is Maori here? No, okay. Uh, India King Robbins comes from Novak in New Orleans. Hi, India. Hi. Hey, um, I'm India. I'm the executive director of New Orleans Video Access Center. Um, I've been there for about four years. And so I'm so grateful to be here in community with many of you who are meet, who are leading film and media organizations. Um, I really value um, the intersection of arts, community and equity. And so I'm always grateful to be in spaces where I can learn and grow from others. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, India. Next, we have Wendy Levy from the Alliance for Media Arts and Culture. Hey, everyone. Can you, am I on? Um, hey, nice to see you. Um, we, I'm Wendy Levy, Executive Director of the Alliance for Media Arts and Culture. Um, and I'm excited about this meeting because every time we get together, it's the, I'm learning something new and it feels like community is being built as we speak. So it's not just an information share. There's, you know, stuff, the chat's exploding, connections are being made. And the Alliance as a national media arts service organization, this is so core to what we do. And because we're also involved in systems change, movement building, community building, new roles for artists, it's, it's just so refreshing to meet new folks in the space and to see how we can help empower all the work that's going on across the country. So just really a shout out to Bayback for expert fac facilitation here and for today's content, especially um, because our, we've been working on a three-year preservation and open archiving initiative that is and so all the people here were just like in love with them and really looking forward to taking what happens here today and moving it out into programs and practices uh, that everyone can benefit from. So thanks a million for including us. Thank you, Wendy. And next in the um, on our advisory committee, he's not here today, but David McMichael uh, is joining us from Hyper Real Film Club in Austin. Um, and Tara Nelson, um, she is on the road and trying to fit us in. I don't know if Tara has joined us yet. I don't think so. Um, but Tara is uh, coming from Visual Studies Workshop. Um, next on the list, we have Sapna Sakya from Center for Asian American Media. Thank you, Paula. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm the Talent Development and Special Projects Director here at CAM or the Center for Asian American Media. Um, we, CAM is part of uh, the National Multicultural Alliance, um, which is made up of five different organizations, um, and we primarily work in the public media space. I am really excited to be a part of this um, network. Um, I think what really excites me is um, not just the content and the learning, but the relationships um, and how there's so much intergenerational knowledge that's being <laughs> passed on here in this particular network. Um, I'm excited about um, learning more on this particular topic of archive. And we have a program called Memories to Light um, that's headed by Stephen Gong, our executive director here at CAM. And I think archive is so important, especially for communities of color where um, a lot of official archives don't necessarily exist. So I'm really excited to learn about this new uh, alliance of archival producers as well. Um, and so thank you so much for having me, Paula. Bevec is always so wonderful. Thank you, Safana. Um, great, now we're gonna go to Matt Schuster from Public Media Network out of Kalamazoo. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Matt Schuster, uh, pronouns he, him. I'm the executive director of Public Media Network. We're a local community media organization that serves the greater Kalamazoo area. We do a lot of work with independent producers, students, people of all ages, and teaching them how to use media and technology to amplify their voice to make change in the community. I'm excited to be here to uh, bring a lot of practices back to our community and also connect our producers into the larger community of independent media as well. Thank you. Thanks so much, Matt. Great. And now we're going to go to Rachel Stolch. And Rachel, please correct me if I've mispronounced your last name. Um, Rachel comes from the Associ Association of Moving Image Archives, AMIA. Hi. Uh, thank you. Thanks to Bayback. This is such a great group. Um, I'm here today representing the Association of Moving Image Archivists. Um, I'm the president currently. Um, our goal and our mission is to preserve and make accessible the world's cultural heritage on film, video, born digital, 
Um, and one of our big projects has been to um, assist media makers, filmmakers to learn steps to help them preserve their own material since so much of the last 125 years is gone forever. Um, and as we're starting to face more and more issues with born digital material, um, this is one of our biggest focus groups. So I'm here to learn more about how to connect with y'all, how to support y'all, how to connect you with um, archives. And I'm delighted to see a few of uh, the EMEA members are presenting in just a little bit. So thanks for having me. Thank you, Rachel. And next we have Mike Wassenaar from the Alliance for Community Media. Hi, Paula. Thanks for, for having us here today. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Mike Wassenaar. My pronouns are he, him. Uh, I'm based in Washington, D.C., working with the Alliance for Community Media. We uh, work with community media organizations throughout the United States. We have members in 42 states, uh, over 400 organizations that are uh, doing work to basically facilitate media education at the grassroots level, help uh, provide storytelling access and, and basic civic information access for local communities, which is becoming more and more important um, as we see uh, the sort of the, the desertification of information at the local level. Um, with this question of sort of like preservation of history is an important one for uh, folks in our field, um, primarily because many, many organizations are very small. Um, they're township, library-based, or in some cases, nonprofit-based. And we actually see caches of uh, of information in people's basements uh, that has been stored for 30, 40 years. And that often reflects the the, the life of, uh, of a community that doesn't necessarily have access to uh, mainstream media. Um, it's very much sort of at the heart of the conversation we're going to have a little bit later on with uh, one of the sort of activists in, in our field, John Hauser. But it's also sort of a front of mind for a lot of our folks as we're thinking about um, the preservation of history, but then also helping to helping local communities understand themselves with each other. It really is sort of the heart of the sort of community media practice that we care about. So I'm really happy to be here with you all, and I hope to connect and learn. Thank you, Mike. Um, next, we have Donald Young, who's also joining from Center for Asian American Media. And Don is not here today, but we're excited that he's a part of this group as well. And we have Jordan Young, who is joining us from Indie Media Arts South. And Jordan is also unable to attend, but we're very excited to be partnering with um, IMAS, um, one of the regional groups um, that has come through the IMAG initiative. Um, and then lastly, we have Vera Zam Zambonelli from Hawaii Women in Filmmaking. Hi, Vera. Aloha, thank you, Paula. Here, Vera Zambonelli with Hawaii Women in Filmmaking. I go by she and her, and I'm extremely excited to be in community with you all. And my whys really resonate with all the whys that have been uh, shared so far, because being in community is the way to move forward. And personally, um, I'm very grateful of this hui, of this network, because it really kept us grounded in a very, um, place-based manner in a sense like you know we are connected through the blue continent you know we are in the pacific continent and but allows us to to you know to to be in community regardless of proximity and i'm really appreciative of that because of whatever i hear through this group is always very inspiring and uh, inform also what we do here on the ground so thank you for putting this together, Paula and, and the team, and I'm a an NEA. And, uh, and I also want to give a shout out to um, a moving image archive, the Ulu Ulu uh, archive here in Hawaii, whose preservation work of, uh, you know, those films, someone was saying in the basement of People's House actually allowed us to, to make the films that we are producing currently, Real Vahina of Hawaii, to document the life and accomplishment of Vahina filmmakers here in Hawaii. And we could do many of those films because Ulu Ulu archived so much material. And so um, we are very grateful for that. So it's a, going to be a very interesting conversation to, to hear. So yeah, thank you again. Uh, and I know I'm always the last with a VZ, there is no way. <laughs> so I'll get back to you, Paula. And thank you again for the opportunity to be in community with you all. Thank you, Vera. And thank you to all of the advisory committee members 
Um, we're really excited to get to work together. So with that, I'm going to pass the baton and we're going to start our first session. And I believe I'm passing it over to my dear colleague, Don Valadez. Hi, thank you, Paula, so much. Thanks, everybody. Uh, I'm good morning or good afternoon. I'm Don Valadez. I'm the director and of uh, youth and artist development at Bayback Media, and I'm one of your moderators today. My pronouns are she, her, and Aya. I'm a queer cis Chicana woman in my late fifties with light olive skin and silver gray mid length hair. I'm wearing a black sweater and my background is a color graded um, image with the Bayback Media logo. I have the pleasure of um, introducing our two um, sessions. And the first session um, we are calling Engaging Local Community Members in an Archival Based in archival based media projects. And I'm really excited um, about this. And let me introduce our um, moderator uh, who actually, let me say quickly, um, one of the people, one of the groups talking are Cyrus and Hubert um, who just completed the Bayback Media Maker Fellowship with their beautiful project, Somebody's Gone. So we're very excited to have this conversation. Uh, I have the honor of introducing Kelly Shea Hicks, who is um, part of Bayback Media's team. Um, she is the co-director of our audiovisual preservation team and is the project director for Community Archiving Workshop for more than a decade. She's an archivist, filmmaker, visual artist, and musician born and raised in the Great Lakes region of the Midwest. Kelly has over two decades of experience establishing successful media preservation access and education programs from the ground up. Her specialization is community-centered education and international field building. She was the lead archivist for the Smithsonian Institution on Audiovisual Preservation Readiness Assessment, the first of its kind at the largest museum in the world. She, worked, she has worked on projects with Kurdish immigrants, musicians, filmmakers, and community members. She's also an installation artist using light and sound, photography, and spoken word performance. And I love this part of her bio. I'm only reading a section of, of her bio that um, says, while her finger picking style recalls early American rural traditions, her music is more experimental than folk. I love that. Welcome Kelly and thanks for moderating what we know will be a very engaging conversation. Thank you so much, Dawn. I don't know where you got such an extensive biography of me. <laughs> I feel like you read up uh, my band camp uh, description from like 2001, but that's very, very generous. Um, I am really excited to moderate this panel today on um, community engagement um, with uh, archival based media projects. I'm really excited about all of our panelists here who are uh, friends and colleagues. The purpose of our panel today is to hear about the exciting work of all of our panelists and be inspired by these thoughtful approaches to archival work and unique and innovative approaches. All of our panelists are working on so many projects uh, with common threads. Um, they're centralizing community and archival practice, developing rich and complex narratives about history and culture by putting community at the center um, and, of interpretation and culture making. And all of them include uh, artistic and creative practices in the art of archiving as well. So these are some of the common threads you can think about when we're when we're listening. And also I invite you when we're listening to the presentations of the panel and engaging in the discussion to think about a couple of takeaways, um, which is how how these how can you apply or might you want to or might we want to share um, uh, practices that engage communities. Um, in our own archival practices and always keep that in the forefront of our brain, both from the uh, maker side and the archive side. And um, also, I hope and invite everyone to think about ways that we can all collaborate. Um, so um, let's keep that in the back of our mind as we um, hear about these wonderful organizations and projects. So without further ado, I will have each of our panelists go ahead and introduce themselves. And we can start with Cyrus and Hubert. Hi, everyone. Yeah. Hey. And that's which one? That's... Oh, Hubert, we can't hear you. 
<laughs> better fix myself. There you go. You can hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> um, nice to be here with you all. It's an amazing group of people and a project that is very dear to our hearts. Um, my name is Cyrus Musavi. I'm a filmmaker and record music archivist. I run a record label called Mississippi Records, and I am co-directing alongside Hubert Taylor, Somebody's Gone, which is a film about the great brother Theodos Taylor, um, a spiritual singer from South Georgia. And this story of Brother Taylor is told through a, a remarkable archive of footage shot over four plus decades by Mr. Hebert Taylor. So I'll pass it over to. Well, good to see everybody. For those who I've never met before, I love you. Can I give you a big <laughs> hug? All right, all right. <laughs> okay, I'm Hubert Taylor. I'm wearing a red shirt. I am a handsome black man. I'm the oldest one in the room. And uh, I just want to say it's nice to meet you guys. Uh, somebody's gone. Um, I tell you, uh, it, it has to be uh, a godsend type situation here because Cyrus came into the family's life a few years ago and we did an album together and uh, on, on Theotis. So we dad wanted to make sure that his music was shared with people other than just his own personal archive. I have footage that I need to have shared with people. It's a lot of footage. And so uh, Cyrus is, is good. Uh, he is very good at, at, at undoing this thing that I have going on here. And it's a pleasure to have met and is still meeting so many wonderful, smart people. And uh, it is kind of reminds me of what I should have been doing all my life as far as being affiliated with what you guys are doing, you know, as a group. But uh, every person has a place and my place basically was to film as much as I possibly could. Uh, I had some situations happen to me uh, when I was in the military and I got this thing stuck in my head that I had to film everything. So I did. And so uh, now it's time to take this footage and put it in, in perspective and tell the story of my dad. That's my primary purpose for, for keeping it all to tell the story of Theotis because he uh, was alongside, alongside with Sam Cooke and some other people, but he never got the recognition because he wanted to be with his family. Uh, he even went to school and uh, <laughs> he even went to school to learn how to operate heavy duty equipment. Then when he got the job, he found out that after he graduated, he found out that he was going to have to be away from the family for months at the time, and he wouldn't go. So dad was just a homebody. Uh, he wrote songs. He performed songs. He was in great demand here. And I'm just kind of a chip off the old block, ex except on the video side. Uh, he did more gospel. I did more contemporary Christian music. I was doing contemporary Christian music before the winings. They don't know me. <laughs> Before take six, they don't know me. But uh, for the most part, I'm blessed to have had the, the privilege to archive so many different people in, in my community. And now we can tell the story. I'm Great. so confused by your job, Cindy. Beautiful, thanks, Hubert. Thank yes. Thank, thanks so much. Hmm? Um, I think we will go ahead and have uh, C, and I'm not sure if Andres is here as well, but C, can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about Entre? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm CVS. Uh, Andres cannot make it today due to work uh, scheduling, but um, we're both co-founders of Entre Film Center, um, located in the Rio Grande Valley of South Texas. I do have a few slides. Is that where we're going to go now? Can I share my screen? or? Sure, let's do it. All right. Um, you might just I think have to I press the request permission button and then okay. you, it will be granted. <laughs> okay. There we go. Okay. So 
Um, I kind of have a lot of slides, but I'll go through them fast. Um, so a lot of people, you know, they think uh, South Texas, they think of uh, San Antonio or Austin, but as you can see where we're at in the map, we're at the very, very tip in the Frontera region uh, that borders Tamaulipas and Nuevo León in Mexico. Um, you can see a little bit closer about the, this. We, we, as a film center and an archive, we service the entire Rio Grande Valley, which is made up of four counties. And we serve over 1.3 million, well, 1.3 really million residents are here in this region. Um, our archive and film center is a space that offers workshops, screenings, and other educational events to entering community made and uh, community made uh, and non-commercial cinema and archival practices. Here you can see some um, photographs from our recent few years of workshop screenings and other sorts of panels that we've hosted. Um, but what I wanted to talk about today and what we're focusing on is the archive and that is a, a community sourced archive, if you will. What we're trying to do is engage with our local community to uh, gather home movies, photographs and oral histories of people from the region, different stories. But one story in particular is the story of Boca Chica Beach. Um, which is where SpaceX is currently located. And it's a beach that was uh, accessible to the public for many, many years until in the recent years when it's becoming less and less accessible due to the much development that's happening on the beach due to SpaceX. So what we learned was that there's not much uh, documentation of this beach in our local archives. So we set out on a mission to collect photographs and oral histories and home movies from uh, community members. And we did that by doing some community outreach at local flea markets, um, some workshops. As you can see here, we posted up at the Brownsville 77 flea market in last March. Um, and we I, I were able to encounter Bernabe Machuca, a man who came to our booth and just talked to us about his family in Boca and what Boca Chica Beach meant to him. And he went home and came back with 12 photographs for us to scan and in, include in the archive. And he's one of our most active donors um, that we've uh, encountered in this project. Um, so here's some photos from the archive for that specific uh, community archival project. Here's some of Benavez photos, some of Joseph Gomez, another donor. Uh, Lori Jasso, who um, a really cool uh, note, or not a cool note, but like an interesting note is that the A-frame house that her and her family lived in in the early 90s um, on Boca Chica Beach, they were renting that house, she raised her children there, um, is still located on, um, on the beach uh, in the SpaceX uh, uh, landscape, it's, and it is used to house people there, so it's still standing. Um, this is on the left is a photo of what the beach looked like um, before a lot of destruction and demolition was brought in. Um, this is a transcript from one of the oral histories uh, that we've collected in April of last year. We were part of a, a uh, exhibition called Nuestra Delta Magica, and it was focusing on unearthing uh, histories in our region from that were untold or censored or removed from uh, public record. And so what we did to contribute to that exhibition was set up a self-service oral history station where people can come to the space and record uh, memories about Boca Chica Beach. Um, I would play this, but it's a little long and I only you know I have a few minutes. So I just, uh, here's a transcript. If anyone's interested, we can share this uh, transcript and recording with you, but it just goes to show like what we're finding is that a lot of people have really beautiful memories growing up going to this beach um, and what it means to them and how the new developments on the beach are becoming, um, you know, major access points for a lot of people that the beach really meant something to, um, especially the people of uh, the Carizo Comicrudo tribe, our indigenous uh, kin here in the region. That's where the mouth of the Rio Grande River where it empties into the Gulf of Mexico, that's where their creation story begins. So a lot of this land is extremely sacred to them and it's becoming less and less accessible to them as well. Um, we also included uh, some written memories. So if people weren't uh, comfortable recording uh, their voices, we could have them write out their memories and they can uh, submit these anonymously or with their names attached. And all of these have gone into the archive. I believe we've collected around 15 in both Spanish and English. Um, in addition to that project, our archive, like I said, focuses on home movies uh, from the region. There's not many home movies that are collected in our area and um, 
there, a lot of them are housed in the Texas Archive of the Moving Image, um, but not too many from the Rio Grande Valley. So uh, it's our mission to, to build a regional interactive map of home movies and oral histories from the region using an open call method and, and training people in our community to become stewards of the archive as well. Um, this past year, we did our home movie day, which we do every year, uh, one of our favorite uh, holidays of, of, of the year. And this year, uh, this past year, we, we partnered with the Texas Archive of the Moving Image and their Texas Film Roundup program to offer free transfer services to people in, across the region to bring their home movies in to be digitized. We set up 12 drop-off sites across the valley. Like I mentioned, there are four counties, so it's a very wide stretch of land. And to make it more accessible to folks, um, we set up drop-off sites at different libraries across the region. And that was able to, they were able to be, um, people were able to take their home movies to those libraries, which we had trained the librarians on intake and all of that. And um, they collected home movies there, which we then picked up and took them to our space in Harlingen to um, send them off to Austin to get digitized. Here are some samples of things we've collected. Uh, we collected over 300 film and video materials this past year. All of them are, are currently in Austin right now being digitized at TAMI. And what we're hoping is that by fall of this year, um, we'll be able to exhibit some of those uh, home movies in a traveling film program and garner more interest and support around the community-led archive and engage more with our community in that way. Um, and that's it for me. Um, if you want to connect with us, you can reach out and I'll send our email in later on. Okay, thank you, C. Um, I think um, we will circle back to learn more about uh, Cyrus and Hubert's project in just a moment. Um, so let's uh, move on. Is Martha here? I am. Hello, everyone. Um, okay, I don't know. I just got a weird message. Um, hello. Uh, are we doing our presentations or we're just introduction? Yeah, I'm sorry about that. We were we were going to just do introduction, so we had an okay. extended introduction. Um, no, no sorry, worries. I can clarify that. Um, so I think if you um, want to go ahead and why don't we do an introduction for you? We'll circle back okay. to Cyrus, and you can both do your presentation. Sound good? Sounds great. Yes. Okay. So my name is Martha Diaz, and I am a media producer, curator, archivist, activist. Um, and uh, and just uh, a, a Jill of all trades. I've been developing my different skills as I've been creating. And I founded the Hip Hop Education Center while I was a student at NYU because I felt like we needed a centralized location where we could find information. Hip hop culture is so diverse and vast that we just couldn't find um, what everyone was doing. And so it started out as a research project, but then it became more, I saw the necessity to archive our history and to use the artifacts for education. And so um, I will be presenting on my latest work um, around um, local uh, archiving through a digital archiving station that I've been developing. Um, I learned this from uh, my, my program at NYU, which is the Moving Image Archiving and Preservation Program. And I just felt like it was so important to tell my community, listen, you need to preserve your history. And you know what? We can do it ourselves. So I'll speak more about that later. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Martha. Okay, I think um, so. We got a good introdu introduction to Entre, and then uh, we'll circle back uh, to Cyrus and Hubert to talk about uh, Somebody's Gone and um, your other projects, archival projects around the film. Great. Thanks so much. Um, yes, so Somebody's Gone, as Hubert mentioned, we've been working on this yeah, film for several it. years. We first met oh, in 2018 yeah. um, through another great artist named Bonnie so. Holly, who introduced us. And our first project was an album release. We were working on Brother Taylor's, releasing Brother Taylor's music. And Hubert and I collaborated closely on 
pulling out archives of home recorded tape reels, digitizing these reels. And I think another really important part of the relationship was um, signing the first real recording contracts of Brother Taylor's career, getting him the first legal recognition for his work. And this is in his 90s when this happened. The record was released. It got a lot of um, wonderful reviews. People all over the world were listening to it. And I think, and I hope it was something that Brother Taylor was very proud of. Um, only then did we turn to this vast archive of footage that Hubert had shot. When we first met, Hubert had told me, hey man, I've been working on a project. And I was like, let's focus on the music first. But only then, you know, did we start to dive into this. And it was um, it was quickly clear how extensive Hubert's video practice was and how deep the archive ran. Um, I'm going to, if it's all right to share my screen, yeah. I can um, share a few Please images. Please just sure. have to request it. Yeah. Is that working? Looks great. Okay, cool. So this is Brother Theodos Taylor on the first day we met back in 2018. This is in the church that he built in Fitzgerald, um, which is a town about three hours south of Atlanta. Uh, this was a really good day. We were filming for a film that eventually ended up, it was a film about Lonnie Holly that ended up at Sundance. It was at the Georgia Film Festival and Hubert brought the whole family up to Atlanta and Brother Taylor was on the red carpet and it was a really joyous occasion. Yes. Um, <laughs> and Hubert, I'm going to turn it over to you soon. I mean, this is these are some shots from the archive of footage that Hubert has collected. There were hundreds of tapes. We've digitized a lot of it, including um, a lot with a grant from Bayvac. Um, one of the main themes that led to this film was, Hubert, you told me that you had been filming because you wanted to show people back to themselves. You wanted to remind them of who they were and who they've become. Um, that, that really got me um, and it's something that I've thought about since and it led to a few of our other projects that we worked on which we can tell about shortly but Hubert if you want to just mention a bit more about what you were shooting and why. Yeah uh, at the time dad's anniversary has got to be huge. Uh, he would always go around and sing to other churches and other folks anniversaries and just a donation kind of thing but then when he would have his anniversary, it got to be big. So we had to have larger and larger venues. And so uh, these photos I'm looking at now remind me of these places where uh, we had uh, like six, 700 people in, in, in one room because we just filled up all the seats. So Theodos Taylor basically in his heart, my dad, uh, even when in his guitar days, he always felt like he was just as good as anybody else. So naturally, when Sam Cook came to town, uh, the the uh, the promoter, Mr. C.C. Hall, would always get Dad to open up the program because Dad, Dad seemed to be the only one that make uh, Sam Cook want to sing. Uh, because some places he would go to, Dad said that he just really didn't want to sing because there wasn't nobody there to sing with him. So uh, yeah, these photos right here remind me of the time when we just really had to find a very, very big venue to get everybody in. And um, I filmed everything because number one, I was the only one who, in only black brother in town at the time who had connection with the local TV station uh, back in 83, 84. I was the only one uh, who had purchased a camera uh, and start doing my own stuff. Before then, I would hire people to do it. And one guy, he had this really nice camera. And so I decided one day to offer him some money for it. And he, and he, he took it. So I took the camera and I was happy. So in my mind's eye, I always had in my heart to just film everything because it was, these events were really, really good events. The other thing too, there is a lot of serious talent in churches, especially in South Georgia. Uh, this is where I'm at. So I did this talent search competition all over Georgia and uh, the hottest places were pretty close to my own hometown. So I would do these, uh, I would film these events and, and capture talent coming from different places. It was just really wonderful. So I had to do it because the opportunity was presented to me. I always wanted to get into the film side of it. I've been a recording artist for a long time, my own way. 
<laughs> and so it's just really been it's really been a wonderful a wonderful uh, experience yes it's an incredible archive there's so much footage of musical performances i mean i work in music south georgia is famous for a very specific special kind of gospel music um so there's a lot of music but there's also day-to-day -day life there's barbecues there's you know like daily events um i was curious hubert if you could just say why you were filming those moments and and also i should also mention that hubert talked about the tv station this is this is part of our collective project together is like i go deep onto something and then hubert unveils an entirely new side of his archive which is <laughs> um you know at one point hubert bought the dilapidated building that housed the old tv station in town and as a result got the entire archives from the local tv so as you said it once hubert you said that your archive was the black side of town and the tv archive showed the white side of town and um i thought it was you know as a result you've collected the entire story you have both sides yeah that is true um the people on my side of town basically the regular folk out in the street uh, they were not exposed to having someone come and film them. So I was the only brother in town that had a camera and I did that. But at the same time, I was working with the, the, t the TV station that come to town. I, I basically uh, wrote commercials, shot commercials, and I was, I was around the, the, the directors and all of the things that it, take, it took back then to make a TV station work. And it was very, very interesting. I became more and more interested in it. I said, I can do this. And I found out that um, uh, the owner kind of liked having me around. So when it was time for me to move, I also do karate. I don't like to mention karate much, but I also uh, been doing karate for a lot of years. So I moved my karate school uh, right across from Grand Theater. So that place got too small. Then I had to have a bigger place and Mr. Pryor's place, which was the old new newspaper building, was abandoned. So that's how I got in it. And when I got in there, the TV station was upstairs. I went in and he had left all of the equipment, all the pictures, all the photos, all the negatives to the newspaper, everything. So I, uh, to me, that was just gold. So I, that's how I got the uh, exposed to, uh, I got access to uh, footage that was shot by my white brothers, you know, the life of my white brothers and sisters at the time. So we'll pass it on now. I know we've taken a lot of time. Um, oh, sorry about that. No, no, that's that was me. I got I got distracted. As you can see, there's a lot going on in this project. Um, but just to say that this project, Hubert's work resulted in a large community archive workshop that Kelly Kelly was a part of. The NEA helped fund. We were able to show Hubert's footage back to the community for the first time in decades. And we were also able to provide free digitization services to people who came through digitize their work. It feels like a first step, a beginning place. Hubert, you've mentioned the Pictures of You Museum that will open in Fitzgerald. But um, but yeah, we just wanted to share with you guys our project and thank you for the time. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is such a multifaceted project. I know we'll have a lot of questions coming up soon. And um, Martha, we're gonna move on to you to talk a little bit about um, the hip hop education center and the uh i think you wanted to talk about the chaos home movie project but correct me if i'm wrong yes it's, it was the chaos community day but um i i will say that i i got interested in archiving um because i had my own collection i had started a hip-hop film festival the first hip-hop film festival in the world and i accumulated over 400 films and I would carry them everywhere every move I've moved over 30 times and so it's you know I'm lugging them around and my children are like why why do you have these and I always just knew that they were valuable these were our stories that um, artists from all over the world were sharing with us and that was our way to to connect and share the struggle and share the wins and just uh, learn about each other. And so I, when I did my, my first master's at NYU, it was around social entrepreneurship. And the last piece of my thesis 
was this connection to the artifacts. And so I took an independent course with Mona Jimenez at, at the uh, MIA program. And she gave me a crash course and I was able to organize this collection, describe them and just put a, va a value to it so that it could really help hip hop culture um, be seen as, a, as an important culture that had a past, a present and a future ahead. And so um, I donated this collection to the Schomburg Center where I also worked for many years as a resident artist and scholar. Um, and today that collection continues to grow because I keep donating more films to it and it's all digitized. There's a finding aid. And I'm just really proud that I was able to save this heritage, right? This is our thing. So that's how I got into archiving. And like I mentioned before, it was really important as an educator for me to, thank you, um, see, uh, it was really important for me to bring some of these artifacts into the classroom. I was bringing old magazines and cassettes and CDs and mind you, this is, you know, early 2000, the students were like, what's this? You know, they, they, were, they have moved on to digital files and P4s and so, um, I, I felt like that was a way to bridge the, the gap, you know, between generations and just really teach young people on the advancements of technology and how we keep evolving. And, and that technology allows us to create in different ways, but that we must, 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 you know, uh, preserve this history because we won't be able to play it back. You know, and so, um, so I just integrated all of this and with the Hip Hop Education Center, we've always used hip hop as the tool to hook people in. But of course we wanna build skills and we, we're always building partnerships. Like I see Wendy Levy's in the house. She's my partner in justice. And, you know, we've been working on a, an apprenticeship program. You know, I've worked on internship programs and, and The Last Frontier was really going into the community and sharing this knowledge with, um, with our people. And I'm so sorry, this is a presentation that I gave yesterday. So I'm like, oh my God, I might as well just use this. I should have changed the title, but I was able to do this community chaos Community Day because of a grant that we received from USC. I'm a civic media fellow at USC's Annenberg Innovation Lab and they were generous to give us a seed grant so that we could test this out. Ben um, Caldwell, who is the founder of the Chaos Network in the Merck Park and also some would consider the mayor of the Merck Park has, um, you know, we've been, we've been collaborating for a long time and he has been holding on to not only his collection and he's one of the, the UCLA founder of uh, black filmmakers who um, were part of the early seventies movement of that really counter the narrative of other filmmakers out there and he, was a pioneer and he held on to all of his material and equipment. And so we wanted to save his, his collection, but then we found out that everyone in the community was donating to him. And so it was more than just his collection that we were looking at to, to preserve, but then we wanted to teach people in the community like what we were doing. So last year for Hip Hop's 50th, um, we thought we could share, we could create this community day and share some of his video. He also uh, developed the first platform for hip hop artists in LA. So all of the, the artists, including Ava DuVernay, who was the M MC, she went to chaos and performed. Um, and so we shared some of that footage, but uh, we had a panel discussion 
And then we had a show and tell. We invited some of the local artists to come through to, um, to share their collections. And what we found out was that a lot of people were already archiving at home, but they just were doing it without any training. And so this is just a timeline of when we started to collaborate, Ben and I, since 2018. And my assessment of his collection was useful in creating a book that he and Professor Taj Frazier um, created. And, um, and then it just shows the, the community day. But about 20 to 25 people would come in and out of our session. And, you know, again, Lamert Park is a, is a tight community of um, African Americans who have been uh, meeting up every weekend in the plaza in Lamert Park to celebrate um, history, to celebrate each other, music, food. It's always um, a place where you can find an intergenerational uh, family programming. And so we, we decided to do it during that day. So we had the panel discussion and I have some video clips and I'm gonna try to go quickly, but we also um, gave a, a survey to the people who were there just to gauge their interest for further you know, um, programming. And everyone was like, yes. And even um, uh, a 81 year, old, year young uh, woman, approached us and was like, you know, I have footage, I have pictures when I was a teenager that I took of Limert Park when Limert Park was mostly a white neighborhood. And now, you know, it's a black neighborhood, but she's like, I, I don't know what to do with them. And so we, we acquired a new collection that's going to be in the Limert, in the Chaos Network collection. And so what we uh, the outcomes we shared, you know, best practices. We learned about uh, forming collections. We we had a like a networking session where everyone was sharing uh, uh, collections, but also inviting people over to see their collections, which was really nice. We also documented the event and we took pictures and photos. We had a photo booth, and um, and then we are now developing the transfer station. And I'm happy to say that we are getting a second grant to actually build out the transfer station so people can come and digitize their photos, transfer their videos. And, and I just wanna share a quick video because I think it's important to, and pardon the, the sound, this is not professional, but it's just to give you a little so um, probably started maybe about seven years ago, I decided to start archiving and putting everything together. So first what you need to do is, if you have slides of negatives, you need to get the archive of slides, sleeves, uh, that the negatives go in and the slides go in. That's good. And those take the negatives. Then from there, I started putting everything in archival boxes. I do the two ring, which is a binder like a notebook, but it's an archival box. I'll just stop right there. I just wanted to give you just a little tip, you know, just, just a tad bit of, um, of the storytelling that took place, which was really rich, rich, rich. And we did, we, we were there for four hours, just sharing pieces. Cause I made everybody, all the panelists bring like 
their most precious item, the most meaningful item. And so they just kept telling stories and, um, and I'll just end it right there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martha. That's really amazing and inspiring. And it is incredible whenever uh, we see projects like this, how once people, how once the stories start, it's like they just keep coming and coming. And um, it's so cool how these um, these recordings like bring back human interaction as well and that storytelling practice. So, um, so see, we included your slides in your introduction, and we wanted to go back and give you a chance to elaborate on some of the um, information that you gave us before, if you have um, something further you want to go a little deeper on. Yeah, sorry for the lightning round <laughs> of great. info. <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess I would like to elaborate more. I'm going to just reshare the slides again. I'll do them on this, on my preview. Um, can you all see that all right? Okay, so I just wanted to, to talk about a little bit about Entra and why uh, it's important that we have this space here in the Rio Grande Valley. Um, there, like I had mentioned before in our map, you can see where we're located. Our region is um, kind of, it, well, it is like locked off by a border checkpoint. So a lot of people who are undocumented cannot get to more, more major metropolitan areas because there is a checkpoint 45 minutes outside of Edinburgh, which is one of our more northern uh, towns um, to get up to places like Austin or San Antonio, Dallas, where you might see more um, yeah, media arts orgs like exhibitions and and things like that and like and uh state uh wide museums such as tammy that have co that house collections like the home movie collection that they have there um i have always been interested in home movies like i've always been the family archivist and have uh transferred a bunch of my own childhood home movies and i also found uh 31 reels from my paternal grandfather's home movies in the 70s that i had ended up doing a whole transfer back in 2016 um, and restoration of um, for my family. So uh, after finding those reels, I wondered whether or not maybe there were more, I knew that there were more out there. So um, when I moved back home in 2021, I got together with my friend Andres Sanchez, who is I think on the call somewhere here now. Um, and we joined forces as artists to create Entre. Um, based on his his knowledge and love of the community that we both grew up in, we both knew like growing up, we were both like lacking spaces like Entre that offered um, space to experiment and explore media arts creation um, and experiment with film and video, um, and also you know contribute to our broader narrative and to shift the narrative of the border region to something that's you know, more nuanced and, and can show varied uh, life experiences throughout. And we, we do that through the archive. Um, there's Andres, hey. Um, and so, yeah, through the archive, uh, we've been focusing on um, just more community involvement and stewarding of the archive with donors and other folks who are in the community who want to learn how to preserve and maybe learn more about these practices, different types of technologies, um, but also kind of use art as a way to continue to keep the archive relevant in our in our times now. Um, Andres, I'm going to pass it over to you if you want to say anything about the archive in the center and yourself. Sure. Sorry I'm late. Hello, everybody. Andres Santos here pronouncing him wearing a purple shirt, incredible hair. Uh, um, <laughs> I yeah, I think that agency is something that this region is kind of like lacked historically on along with like documentation. Um, it's really difficult to to pass down local history if it's not preserved somehow and so that's a massive motivator for uh, our archival practice and also just as artists who who favor you know the more marginal sides of of any kind of art practice and creative practice uh we also want to help foster an, a space for people to to learn and feel supported uh so that they can grow um and so yeah that's all i have you, you covered a great scene so yeah um you know, in as an archive, like I mentioned earlier, we are focusing on the home movies and oral histories of our region. And uh, we're just super excited to see what comes back from this latest round of collections uh, it, with in, in partnership with Tammy. And that's one of the things that we are also really excited about as a small org. Um, I don't know if we've mentioned this already, but we are a creative cooperative. We're a worker-owned cooperative. So 
part of the ethos behind Entre is that we're creating a space where people have agency over the, the labor and energy and love that they're putting into some sort of, into this organization, whether that's through teaching or screening like programming or working in the archive or doing community outreach. Like we want people to have, to feel like what they're building with us is also something that they are creating themselves, you know, and they have a part in that. Um, so we're hoping to shift our, our um, you know, the, the economic landscape of our region. We're, we're like the only cooperative in this region. Um, you know, there are a lot of rural cooperatives, but uh, we're one of the mo very only creative cooperatives um, doing something similar to doing what we're doing here. So we're just excited to be in partnership with folks who are on this call right now, like Davak and Amia. Um, just really cool to see like all these communities come together and we'd love to continue these collaborations and partnerships into the future. Great, thank you so much. Yes, I agree. This is so inspiring to see all this work. And we have, uh, we have time now for an open Q&A. We have 15 minutes. Um, I do think it's important. Um, I don't think we, we really, I wondered if I could uh, start the Q&A actually with asking um, Cyrus and Hubert to uh, maybe elaborate a little bit on the um, the Pictures of You uh, project, um, because I think that's important for our next um, discussion and we didn't get to touch on that too much. So if you don't mind, if you could kick us off with a little information about that, I think that would be great. Well, uh, Pictures of You basically is something that I uh, I had a vision about it many, many years ago. Uh, it was even before I uh, ran across this archive here, you know, at the newspaper and the TV station. And I needed a, uh, I needed a place to show, physically show the pictures back to the community, make them available to the community. I envision a place where they can walk in and be able to enjoy what they see. And if they wanted a copy of it, have the ability to, pretend, to print a copy if they wanted a certain segment on a t-shirt, uh, something like that, be able to have that capability. So the pictures of you concept is where it, it was It was birthed through having all, all of this uh, archive, this archive, I wanna do something with it. So I wanna right. preserve it and I didn't know how. So my place looks like a jungle, but I'm the only one that knows where everything is at. <laughs> so. Uh, Cyrus and I work good together because he's un, he's discom uh, well he's taking my mind and kind of putting things in perspective yeah. where I'm just loaded with ideas and things and I can't I don't have nowhere to put them I don't ran out I got so many ideas I just just ran out where to put them so he's just really been good about that so the pictures of you is going to uh, also catapult me into doing uh, uh, videos. I'm talking yeah. about like music videos, you know, the music video thing yeah. uh, that Cyrus and I haven't talked about. Oh yeah, I haven't heard about <laughs> that one yet. Um, <laughs> okay. Here, let me let me take. Um, yes, so that is that's a good example of our collaborative technique, which is like Hubert has a vision and a brilliant idea, and I try to like channel it into some kind of thing that Reality. we can see. I wasn't gonna say that then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so so Hubert had said for a long time, like, is not enough to document this material. And this is something that I feel too. I mean, an archive that is closed or that is not accessible doesn't doesn't feel like uh, any kind of service, really. I mean, um, a lot of our project came from Hubert's dad not being able to watch footage of himself that he had that was that had appeared on television in the '70s. He'd been looking for it for decades. I found it in a few minutes by emailing the University of Georgia Library. You know, it was. It was there. It was it was technically available, but it wasn't accessible. So a big part of this project has been showing people back to themselves. We took this idea that Hubert had applied for a grant from the NEA, collaborated with the Association for Cultural Equity and the Alan Lomax Archive, collaborated with the Community Archive Workshop, and in early December brought a large group of archivists from the Smithsonian Museum of African American History from um, Caw and from the UGA library to Fitzgerald, they provided this free digitization service. And then the next day on the big screen in a movie theater that has been around for almost a hundred years, that was a whites only theater until, you know, way too far into the 20th century. 
um, we showed Hubert's footage to a group of people who were both in it, who had, you know, heard about it. And it was a remarkable moment. It was really emotional for everyone there. There was tears. Um, and it felt like the beginning of something. So that was that was a big project for us. And it was a way that, you know, that footage I think will come into the film, but it's also the film is a vehicle for creating and bolstering the archive. Um, we also had amazing live gospel performances that night and a comedian. Yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, I want to say too that uh, uh, that was my first time actually trying to sing like my dad and play like my dad after I had this bad accident back in 2020. And uh, Cyrus says I did pretty good, so I'm waiting to get some footage on that. But for the most part, uh, I'm supposed to be the only one that I've heard of that can actually sing and play like my dad. So I got to get my nerves and my numbness out of my fingers and all that. So I've been practicing on that. So, uh, yeah, that's another era, uh, right. area. Well, that's, that's an important thing. It's like the archive lives within you as well. It's not just well, yeah. <laughs> the material. And I mean, that's the most important archive is the one that yeah. like, the songs yeah. we can't forget, the images that stay with us. So, yeah. Yeah. But you sound like him. If you close your eyes, I'd be fooled. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Since you've been around and, you know, you developed a good relationship with dad. You know what I mean? And I really appreciate you being there. I appreciate you and Brittany and, and Charles and everybody being there and uh, Daryl Hall and uh, Cody and so forth and so on. It's been a privilege. And, uh, I, yeah, it's just been a wonderful thing. So we do work together like this. I mean, I'm stuck in an era. Cyrus basically interprets what I'm trying to say. <laughs> and then he put the technical aspects to it. And that's how we do. Collaboration. Thanks, so much. Thanks, Thanks so much. Kelly. Great. And I love that the archive uh, lives within people. And I think this comes back to like Mar Martha's project where people start interacting with the footage. They start telling stories. That's a lot of times where where the magic actually happens is encouraging people to uh, do what you don't do in a traditional theater, which is listen without the interaction and, and add your stories. But we have a couple of questions from our panelists, um, and I really like these questions. Um, both of these are, what well, one is about community outreach and one is about lessons. And I think this is talking about partnering with institutions. And um, so um, I, I'm actually gonna start with the institutional partnership because we haven't touched on this at all. Many, all of you are working with larger institutions. Um, uh, or maybe larger than than your project. So Texas Archive of Moving Image, Schomburg, NEA. So there's this like collaboration between um, these community centered projects and institutions. And do you all have one or two tips or lessons learned or thoughts about collaborating with larger institutions that you can share with the group? And we can start with any of you who, anyone who's ready. I can go. Um, I'm a really big proponent for um, collaboration and partnership with institutions. Like we mentioned earlier, like uh, Entre is a creative cooperative. So we are kind of barred from applying for funding for that is, you know, for a lot of nonprofits. We don't intend on becoming a nonprofit. We're very adamant about that. So we like to partner with uh, organizations that have that status to be able to have access to funding, but also create programming together so that way we can expand our reach as a, as an organization and so that more people can have eyes on what we're doing down here on the ground um, but it's important for us to keep the the uh, the the archive very regional and centered in the community um, but having that that support from outside is super important so like not only with the Texas archive of the moving image which I like have had a relationship with for several years and just recently was able to merge just the the ad admiration I had from afar to now being able to work to them, work with them um, in this home movie initiative. Um, but also with like Columbia University where I held a fellowship last year working on the Boca Chica project, now working with them in strategizing how we can, um, you know, expand our, our networks and be able to support the dream of building a digital repository for our region that is stewarded by our community. But how can we do that without you know the resources behind that and that that access point and maybe to other consultants and and partnerships and collaborators um so yeah that's 
for us, it's very much we have to keep these partnerships with folks who are in alignment with our ethos and our values. Um, that's a really big one as well. And making sure that um, you know our, our community is properly represented. Andres, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. In terms of reaching out to libraries in our end uh, of things or in our neck of the woods, it was really just, you know, down to see sending a bunch of cold emails to and reaching out to folks and introducing them to the idea of like an archival practice or like having some sort of like drop off site for our home movie day uh, uh, event. And uh, all it took was just like reaching out to them and saying like, hey, are you interested in doing something like this? Maybe it hadn't occurred to them before. They'd never thought about archives or even home movies. Um, and then we just kind of like expanded their, their, you know, minds about a little, uh, about that stuff. And, um, cause a lot of folks, especially in our area, which, you know, is fairly remote to Texas. And we have a lot of people that live in rural areas, a lot of low income areas down here. A lot of folks don't think about this kind of stuff, you know, they're busy trying to survive. And so, um, us being able to go to them is huge. And so, yeah, just making that extra step, I think is really important. Great. That's really insightful. Thanks. Um, uh, Martha, do you have anything? Yep. To yes. Um, well, you know, I've never been really funded by, uh, or, or I should say, I haven't received major funding, like a big, you know, grant. So a lot of times I have to partner with institutions to make up for that lack of funding. Um, definitely reaching out to your local libraries, museums, you know, they definitely want to collaborate. Um, I've also been working with, um, because I'm focused on hip hop culture, I have been tapping into those institutions that collect hip hop. So for example, the first uh, symposium on hip hop archiving and preservation, I teamed up with Cornell's hip hop collection, as well as the Smithsonian Archive Center. I also teamed up with NYU in the second um, edition of that symposium. And, and like I mentioned before, with uh, the uh, Arts to Work or the Alliance for Media Arts and culture, we've been collaborating with uh, in, in Watts, um, and we are also doing work in Pittsburgh. And so we are, I'm constantly creating these collaborations um, with, with um, institutions, but I'm also bringing in the community. I'm also bringing in the pioneers, the people who have collections who need the help, and I'm making those introductions because I know that they can't, they don't have the access. And so I'm using my privilege to make those connections as well. Ellie, I would just add, um, I saw some conversation about SAM IDs. I would just echo something C said, and uh, also what I'm seeing in the comments about choosing your institutions very carefully, choosing who you align with very carefully. That means, you know, people who are, are on the same, you know, reading the same thing as you, seeing the same thing as you, but also institutions who might already have access to these larger funders. Um, so we collaborated with the Association for Cultural Equity. They were already hooked up with the NEA. We didn't have to, as a tiny film production, we just wouldn't have the resources to set ourselves up with all these different kinds of um, requirements that you know, we'd have to jump through. So we were able to get around that by working with people who got what we were doing and also had the connection. Um, and also with, with the group that you're part of, Community Archive Workshop. I mean, um, Mariah put us in touch with the Smithsonian. It was, it's it's a lot like you were saying, Andres, it's, you're surprised by how quickly people will glom onto a good idea. And we'll be like, hey, let me, um, let me jump on this. And so those, those kind of interactions are good for everyone. And then I think it gets more difficult when you think about where do the actual, where do the actual materials go? Who controls these objects? Who decides who else gets to see them? Um, and that's where you have to be really careful because that's where funding is really important, but it's also where institutional alignments can can come into conflict. Great. Can, can I just add something to that point? Um, because it's really important that we stay grounded in community by figuring out ways to uh, create like our own uh, our own digital asset management system where we could store our own material. I, I find it very difficult 
to accept that the largest hip hop archive is in Cornell University, four hours away from New York City, or that Harvard University has a hip hop collection and it's by appointment only if they respond to your email. You know, that that's problematic for me. And so I'm also organizing my community for us to create our own uh, dam and, and for our own, you know, institutions. And of course, I'm happy to say that, you know, we are seeing more hip hop museums launching the Bronx just launched one, South Africa just launched one, Museum of Graffiti in Miami. So we're building our own institutions, but um, it, you know, and there's nothing wrong with collaborating with those other institutions as long as we remain in control of our narrative and have a copy. Well said, I think that is a perfect way to end this discussion. Thank you so much. This is such a rich discussion. I um I I know we have uh like we have topics to cover in a whole other um a whole other panel discussion sometimes, but we have to leave it there um today. So um are we am I passing this yeah. back to John? Uh Passing it back to me. Thank okay. you so much, Kelly, for moderating that. Thanks to all of our panelists. That was really incredible. I'm going to go away with the concept that access, 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 and also something about like using whatever privileges we have to be able to create and support our communities in doing this work. Um, that was so powerful. And I know we could continue talking about this for a really long time, bringing community together sharing um so beautiful um please check out the chat for links um and also remember that we'll do a follow-up from this meeting there's a recording with the other links so um we know we could talk about this for hours and actually our next panel um which is really going to be equally enlightening and actually we'll be talking a little bit about this media management and i love this idea of like ownership of the media management um mike um wasnar who introduced himself earlier um, is going to be leading this uh, this section, and we're calling it from the basement to the cloud, and really looking at key issues of preservation, dig digitization, workflows, archiving, and sustainability. So perfect flow from the uh, um, the first panel. Take it away, Mike. Well, thank you, Dawn. I, I don't know if I can if we can be as inspiring. Um, I I'm just sort of gobsmacked by by the conversation. Um, particularly in, in terms of the ability of folks to be able to have their work reflect the lives of their communities to themselves with each other, um, which I think at its best has been the heart of uh, core practices of community media centers across the United States since the 1970s and 80s. Um, you know, since that time, community media centers often operating public educational and government channels, but also uh, operating in partnership with local cultural institutions uh, and education institutions have really been sort of documenting the lives of their communities in, in many ways, shapes, and forms. We wanna talk a little bit about uh, the work that's happening now and sort of the challenges that we, we face. One of the uh, sort of the key concepts or, or problems that often faces these centers is that they are seen as, they often see themselves as conduits for other people's expression. They don't necessarily see themselves as curators or particularly as authors of that community expression. So very often uh, what you see in some uh, nonprofit uh, institutions, libraries, believe it or not, uh, some local government institutions, educational institutions, is that what has often been perhaps hundreds of thousands of hours of content that has been produced by by and for and about local communities hasn't been saved by that organization that has been doing that collaborative work of producing, training, and distributing media to local communities, even back into the 1970s. It's sort of an, an astounding thing to be thinking about um, in that when we talk with some community media centers that have been in, in practice since say 1969, 1970, uh, many of them do actually do not have the physical media that they produced over the course of that time because they did not see themselves as the copyright holders. It was the individuals who came to those centers 
who were the copyright holders. So actually, you see, um, actually, uh, in in some instances, um, uh, distributed art archives that by by the producers themselves, by the 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 regular folks that created media. If I can if I can uh, steal Hubert's line from uh, the last session, um, you know, really we're working with regular folks to help create media about local communities. In other instances, you actually did see visionaries in the field hanging on to that media because of its political importance, perhaps because of its cultural significance, in some instances because of the, the production that was taking place locally uh, to be creating, say, for example, documentation of local arts and film festivals um, uh, that you see actually, uh, actually, so I just saw a collection uh, this past week in the city of Minneapolis uh, where um, the you know, Northeast Art of World, which has been a, uh, a local arts festival, had document had documented through uh, MTN, um, the, the Minneapolis Telecommunications Network, uh, something like 30 festivals. Um, so you actually see sort of the, the, the life and progression of arts within a neighborhood within Minneapolis uh, in that work. Um, that's all now residing in a basement. Uh, rather than actually residing in people's uh, with people's devices or in the cloud. So I think one of the, the great challenges that the organizations that, that I work with across the country find is if they have those resources, they need to be finding ways to be able to get them to people where they are, when they are, how they are, as opposed to looking into sort of like the, the analog and digital media that's housed in in stacks in a, in a basement. Uh, that's, I think, sort of the, the grand challenge um, that a lot of our organizations face. Um, and it's actually a, a lot of organizations, um, just to give you a sense of what these organizations look like, uh, the average size of the organization, probably a nonprofit of about $400,000 a year at the local level. Maybe they have two or three employees. It's not a huge organization by any means. Um, but there are organizations like these in some 42 states in, in the United States operating uh, channels. And there's probably at least 2,000 of these organizations, loosely affiliated, not necessarily self-identified with one another. So there's this enormous sort of cultural challenge of getting these materials back to the community after they've been, been produced. Um, one of sort of the visionaries in the field that I want to introduce you to and have a conversation with and, and invite you to have some you know, conversation with and some questions for is John Hauser, who joins us from Eureka, California. Um, those uh, woods behind him, um, I don't think are precisely where he is, even though he seems to be wrapped up pretty well for Northern California weather. John has been working with uh, Access Humboldt in Eureka uh, and with the Internet Archive uh, for over 15 years to help to provide archival services for community media centers to be able to uh, tell their story uh, in the cloud and actually preserve the, the history, the collective history of uh, our organizations and the regular folks that we have been serving throughout that, that time um, through an enduring uh, uh, media uh, that we hope, the, the internet. So we've invited him to, to have a conversation with us here a little bit about that work. Um, John is a kind of a humble man, um, uh, but uh, I, I you know, let you tell you a little bit about uh, the work that you've done, John. It's sort of astounding the amount of material that you've uh, enabled people to see over the course of 15 years. Can you tell us a little bit about the project and a little bit about how that has begun uh, up in Eureka and with your work with the Internet Archive? Sure. Thanks, Mike. Um, I'm John Hauser. Uh, pronouns are he, him. Uh, land acknowledgement is uh, we live on the uh, we are ancestral lands. Um, the reason I got into this was I came from an IT background before, actually, let me preface that. I was a suit for 13 years, worked in the corporate world, worked in the uh, large international consulting, and um, I'm repaying my sins, my former sins uh, <laughs> since then. So one of the things about um, the reason I wound up kind of getting involved in community media was because of the community part of it. Um, I had left the corporate world and back during web 1.0, the uh, open source got involved in free software and the open source movement and the Linux uh, operating system. And that was, those were heady days in the late nineties of kind of building the future when there was no corporate interest in this. 
It was just a bunch of individuals doing it, very empowering. And uh, I missed that sense when, when the free software world got taken over by the suits, kind of like, okay, well, what's the next bunch of people? I, I, where's my tribe now? And uh, uh, moved up to Eureka, and, uh, which is about five and a half hours north of San Francisco. And there's still another hour and a half to go before you hit the Oregon border. So um, we live in an area where uh, our county is 100 miles long and 40 miles wide. The nearest biggest place is three hours away one way or four hours away the other way. So we're kind of the center of that of that area. Um, the, uh, the key is um, because we're so because we're rural, the barriers between organizations and institutions up here are much less. We wind up helping each other because we're behind the Redwood Curtain and we have to rely on each other instead of necessarily our natural institutional affiliations. So I found the, uh, the local access center in Humboldt County. At that point, they ran four TV stations. And um, what I wanted to do was I was used to having public Wi-Fi in the library. Nope, didn't have it here. So I went to the library and I said, I'd like to work with you. I'm a technology guy. I'd like to work with you about uh, putting Wi-Fi in. Nope, can't do it. Don't have the bandwidth. Talked to the county. They said the same thing. Turns out this community media center had fiber from the library to their uh, center. And so as part of that, we wound up running, I wound up putting in free public Wi-Fi in the main branch of the library and ran that for four and a half years. Um, coming to it from the IT side, when well, we didn't have enough bandwidth to wind up letting our community members that didn't have cable TV, because this community media that Mike's talking about in the United States really is accessed over cable TV. And this is before the cord, even before the cord cutting years, only about a third of the population of Humboldt County has access to cable to the cable system. So the rest of the people don't have any access at all to their government meetings, to the, so their civic in, information is important, but they don't have access to it. They don't have access to the free speech public access TV channel, and they don't have access to the educational TV channel that's run by this Access Humboldt organizations, the local community media center. And so what I wound up doing was trying to find a way for us to solve the video on demand, the distribution problem. And how do we get uh, this information off of the cable system onto the internet? And there were a couple of options, none of them very good. And uh, so we started looking at partners and we talked with the folks down in San Francisco at the Internet Archive. They wound up um, saying, yeah, sure, bring it on for free forever. We'll host it for free forever. So, so stop for a moment. And for sure. those people who are not familiar with the Internet Archive, can you describe what they are? Yeah, the Internet Archive, um, their model, and this is important um, because sometimes it runs afoul of, of people with local closed connection needs. Their model is an open digital public library. So there are possibilities of working with them. If you want people to have access to your material, the model works. If you want some sort of tiered access or password protected access, it's not gonna work working with the archive. Um, having said that, um, it winds up oftentimes working well as a second or third copy of your material. Um, it works as a disaster recovery thing. Access Humboldt doesn't have a lot of money. We've lost our archive server, our four terabyte archive server. We've, we've lost the disks in that thing at least four times because over 80% of our producers have given permission for us to archive their work. That allows us to bring back the, the, video, the digital files as well as the metadata and we reload and, and go on. Um, so that's that's an advantage. But so it's important that um, uh, the founder of the Internet Archive is obsessed with recreating the Library of Alexandria. He's a text guy. He's a book guy. 
even though they have been running a TV news archive for over 20 years, they record 115 channels, 24 hours a day. Um, they, they're really doing some amazing work in that, in that area. Um, but, but that's a really tiny piece of the archive. Um, the work that I did, um, again, getting back to this idea of being a systems guy, I wanted to solve the problem, not just for me, but for the fact that there are, you know, 2000 of these centers across the country. Um, and so I said to him, I said, look, you know, I don't want to solve it just for myself. I want to work with these other centers. And yeah, free, for free forever, bring it on. So we had a place for it. We had a potential place for it. And uh, since that start, we started uploading our, our video to the Internet Archive, figuring out how to work in a system that wasn't designed for uh, video or movies. You know, they're second-class citizen. Books and texts were there. The, their, their archive was primarily set up that. And so we started this, I started this, this collaboration with them where I would go down there four or five times a year and work out how we could make this work. And they would, I would ask for this little change and show them how it fit into the big picture and they would go ahead and do it. So since that time, uh, 15 years ago, when we started out doing one access center, we've got over 2,100 collections out there. Um, there's over 2 million videos um, out there uh, headed towards 2.5 million videos. And the uh, uh, it takes up about two petabytes of disk space. And that's a hundred of the largest hard drives that you can buy these days. Um, it's online, hosted by the Internet Archive. Um, I wind up focused. I, I started out the first six years of doing this work. I started out teaching access centers or working with access centers about archive. Uh, they wound up do it yourself, and so I would wind up teaching them. And after six and, years, and, and to, be, to be clear, John, you're also talking to know the importance of hanging on to things. Sure. Right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, the, the problem with archiving in a in a per, in a production setting or in a TV setting, you know, there's not enough hours in the day. And the problem with workflows is the archiving is sitting out here at the end of the workflow, the very tail of the workflow. If you have enough time, oh, by the way, archive. It, it's a it's a one you get around to it. Issues. Yeah, yeah, that's the yeah. Nobody's asking for it. Um, Mike mentioned the the copyright or the the gatekeeper issues that they didn't feel that this was their job to archive it. So it didn't happen. And so what I wound up doing, because I got into it from a distribution standpoint, is like, how do we make archiving equals distribution? And um, that was when I started noticing YouTube, um, YouTube didn't exist when when I started this project, YouTube had a one gigabyte or 20 minute limit. That was it. So it wasn't going to be useful for a five hour government meeting, uh, for, um, longer format stuff. So what I started doing was um, figuring out that we should go and, um, yeah, I've, I've lost the thought. So anyway. Um, so uh, let, me, let me make me dial back for a moment. So, sure. so Part of what you've been doing is some evangelical work, if you will. You've been going out to folks to actually speak in, in local settings to talk about the need for co uh, collecting stories and then also building workflows to be able to have them published right. to some published to some yep. open media media standard, and, right? And that was and that was the the end of the kind of do-it-yourself archiving and getting into this archiving as a service piece um, was that look. This was when YouTube and Vimeo started taking off as distribution platforms. So even though these were local cable TV stations, as they wanted to get more distribution, they started using these new national distribution channels. I looked at that and said, well, let's do a study of how many of these centers were using YouTube and, and Vimeo. And it turns out there were 20, including educational uh, access centers, there were over 3,000 of these things around the country. And so I wound up deciding that I was going to shift from trying to teach people how to archiving, which props to you other speakers that, that spend the time doing that. I don't have the patience for that. 
Um, the 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 long term, uh, as as you get staff turnover, as you as organizations go in and out of existence, um, that that seems to be rolling rock up the hill. So what I figured out was, what's a software workflow to be able to pull from the YouTube channels and from the Vimeo channels of these community media centers, download the information, enhance the metadata, come up with a metadata format that works not that's Dublin Core or PB Core 2 or, you know, work with kind of five or six basic metadata elements and then get that up to the unit archive where people, again, people like Access Humboldt that didn't have the ability to host their own information, it could be hosted somewhere at a major institution like the unit archive. Um, at this point, we're about 2% of the, disk space of the internet and, and the number of items at the internet archive and so communities from around the country are benefiting from this again the information's got to be um uh open access it has to be you want to have to share it or you have to want to share it with the public in order for the internet archive to be a, an appropriate place um as part of that switch I obviously changed from this do-it-yourself archiving evangelizing to this kind of working with born digital. You know, born digital was the low-hanging fruit. Let's kind of go out and get that and let's build the scale of the archive because building the archive, while it has benefits for each of these organizations, that's only phase one of the plan. You know, phase five or six is getting to the point of being able to have uh, one place where you've got uh, organizations from around the country doing this so that academics can go and study this and look at this. And it's just fascinating the sorts of things um, that you can see from this. Public access, or sorry, community access, the original premise was local voices, local audience. That was your local cable system. But as the internet came along, the premise became local voices, but global audience, you've got global reach. And inside our local centers, we use that to say to our producers, I'm, you probably know the, some of these people, these are people that you can't even get to um, put more of a uh, spine label on a VHS tape with a Sharpie. If you ask them to fill out metadata fields and a description field, you know, you don't get much. It's in the credits, they'll say, it's in the, it's in the video. Um, so, the in trying to get this information to the point that it's consistent or reasonably consistent, at least in the number of fields, so that you can search across it. You can now look at it at what communities, if, if there's a problem in one community, what other communities had that problem? What's the spread of things across the country nationally? You can look so at are that. You, so you're actually seeing that in, in, I mean, I don't know if you've done any studies of this, but you're actually seeing thematic sort of thematic uh, issues popping up over and over again? In sure, the because, collecting? Be, because no community, uh, I'm sorry. Um, the, the issues in every community, a good chunk of those are issues that are shared across communities. How you wanna slice that information, you can see that occurring over and over again. Um, and so the question is, if what was the first what was the first small area to experience homelessness, or or look at homelessness outside of large cities? Um, it, if this appeared starting to be talked about in a community early a long time ago, what's happened in that community? Are they still talking about it, or is there some sort of solution that wound up working for that organization? Um, COVID, um, as, as COVID was, we didn't know what it was, but as you wind up looking at the metadata and you search for keywords, you can wind up starting to see this thing. You, you start to understand what an exponential uh, algorithm is, or, or the, the numbers just shot up like that in the first probably month or so. Anyway, um, I'm off on a tangent. So, so let me let me kind of really back in here and we'll get some, we can mm -hmm. actually get some, some, some questions from folks sure. too. So, so you know, there's an interesting, is an interesting question that came up in the chat or the observation is about the about 
the the fact that you're working through an, an intermediary uh, of YouTube, which could change its terms of service at any point in time. Yep. Uh, from a sustainability standpoint, is there a, is there a workaround for that, or is there a, a way in which that uh, that can be that can be uh, uh, ameliorated? I think that people uh, sustainability is really popular to talk about these days. And it's an it's an illusion. Um, organizations live a life; they have a life cycle. They die, people die. Um, YouTube can change at any time. Vimeo can change at any time. The Internet Archive can disappear. I can die. I can get hit by a bus. Are we better off now than we were before we had this? And the answer is yes because, uh, or, or at least that's kind of how I've come up with it. Um, I would rather do the work than go out and do the fundraising. Um, I do partnership building on the local level, and that's allowed me, um, there is no money for this work that I'm doing. This has either been self-funded or stuff has been donated to the city school system. The joke is um, they wheeled in a server on a cart and they said, no backsies on the server, but we want the cart back. The cart was more valuable than the machine that they were giving me. Um, the Internet Archive has donated hardware to me um, as they have gone on to bigger and better hardware. They wind up donating hardware. So sustainability is, you know, it's the project has grown. But if YouTube goes away, there's going to be some other platform. And there will be there will probably be open source software developed by the community to get information out of that. I want to wind up making a pitch about working with the archive. When you choose a partner for archiving, there's um, you want to make sure that you can get out what you put into it. That's probably the biggest issue. And uh, with YouTube, your original's not saved. The original thing that you put out, it winds up getting put into like 16 or 17 different formats. And nowadays they're focused on the streaming formats, adaptive bitrate things. So it doesn't exist as an MP4 file maybe, um, or anything higher than that. Um, you wanna wind up making sure, and, and the Internet Archive, you can do this. If you put information into the archive, you can get it out in multiple formats and multiple ways. And so, you want to wind up kind of backing up you you know the internet archive you don't want it as your old your own copy it's your second it's your third copy um i think that makes sense so uh, paula asked an interesting question here about partnering with the archive i mean what, mm -hmm. what kind of suggestions would you have for organizations uh media arts organizations artists filmmakers who I, were interested in that kind of uh in a relationship with that type of open source organization i think the i think the best answer is to leverage the power of your organizations and associations um they have very few people but you know there are probably three people in their collections department and the last time I checked, which is over 10 years ago, they had over 850,000 collections. So this is not a place where you wind up handing them stuff and saying, here, please digitize this and fix up the meta, you know, come up with the metadata sort of thing. Um, most of their partners bring money as well as the project. Um, they have fee for service offerings, but we're the largest project that don't. And one of the reasons why that is, is because this long-term relationship we have, and because I work, I'm the first level of support. I'm the ambassador of the archive to the community media organizations, and they don't have to answer the first questions. You won't get a collection set up by the internet archive if you don't have more than 50 items. Uh, so 50 videos or that sort of thing, because there's just too many of them. What, uh, once you get 50, you can request a collection set up. There's a contact for you, the director of, um, I can't even remember what her full title is, but it's alexis at archive.org. So it's A-L-E-X-I-S at archive.org. 
and she's the director. Last I knew, she was the director of Web and Collections. And so if you're one of these organizations of archivists or organizations of filmmakers, then she would be the person um, to talk with. And I think that they would be as welcoming to you as they were, as they were to me. Um, I wound up wanting to do this for the community media organizations. And there was a lot of stuff we had to figure out. And I wound up doing the work. It wasn't them that wound up doing the work. They wound up kind of giving me permission and giving me space. So um, they've got great documentation. Well, compared to what it used to be, they've got very good documentation now. Help.archive.org is the subdomain, and they've got uh, 74 or 80 topics uh, in there about how to do this. Um, so that's that's probably the best way for part uh, to talk about partnering is through your organizations and associations. I, I would uh, love to, to hear some questions from other folks in the group here for for John uh, about both his experiences, but then also just perspectives uh, in yeah. terms of doing this kind of work. Um, so we've got uh, a few minutes here before four o'clock Eastern to to open it up for questions from folks in the room. I'm seeing I'm seeing Hubert speaking, but maybe Hubert, you need to to be. Oh, okay. I apologize. I apologize. Please hey, go, yeah, go, go, go back. Go back to what you said that was very <laughs> profound a moment ago. <laughs> yeah, you got me. Yeah. So when I first got the building and I saw all this, I wanted two um, things to come to pass. One, people walk in, see the product, enjoy the product, get the schools to book classes to come in and then show them movies and stuff like that. And the other thing I wanted to do was make it available on the web so that people would be able to, you know. But the problem that uh, that we have here, at least in the beginning, back in the, in the, in the late 70s and early 80s, was that they were off, the TV station was actually operating off of TV cable, which, which ran aerial, and then it would go from aerial to the houses and stuff like that. It was very local. Then after a while, they, I was on the team that started burying the cable underground. And my team was uh, responsible for taking the old aerial wire out of the air and putting it on the ground. So my question is, um, can we overcome? Can we get this done uh, through the web thing only? And if so, do we have to consider the accessibility of fiber optics and stuff like that? Do you understand my question? There, um, if you have analog, uh, your TV station was probably analog. So it's in the days, it probably shut down when VHS tapes or maybe even DVDs were were how they had programs on them. So you would need a place in town with enough upload bandwidth to be able to take, uh, let's say a digital file in the case, uh, or, or, a, or an MP4 file, a movie file out of a modern camera, you would have to wind up uploading that across the internet to the archive. And whether that's fiber optic or not, it doesn't need, it doesn't need to be fiber optic, but most of the um, other than that last mile, most of the connections these days are fiber optic um, as far as the internet goes. So I wind up, um, I wind up, my servers are hosted at the Eureka City School System, and I wind up generating more bandwidth from the 88 schools in the county do, but, um, but they were looking, the California Education and Research Network was looking to upgrade the connection to a 10 gigabit connection from a one gigabit connection for our entire county, 88 schools. They, they couldn't make the business case until I said, I think I can help you with that. I can use that. And, and so right now I've got a big enough connection that, that that's how I get information to the archive is that I upload it over a fast internet connection. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I think one of the other, other things that I think Paula mentioned in the, in the chat to John is that, that there's a potential here to be working with the partners for various centers across the United States so that those individual those individual folks, neighborhood organizations could be could be doing using that kind of resource to be able to to have an internet presence that could be then fed back to the local community, right? So the, the, that's sort of the benefit of the repositories. It's not just storage, it's actually right, playback, right. playback and sharing capability that's on the community's terms, right? Right. Um, that was the, my original vision for the archive was not only getting information into the archive, but then using it as a mechanism for sharing. Because the playback server vendors, uh, play, a, a playback server is what a TV station uses now. It's basically a computer with a, a graphics card in it that outputs video to the cable company's head end. Um, mm -hmm. And that's how, the, that's how the TV programs get on your uh, TV these days. Um, so the, uh, lost it again. Um, it's the, an issue of the community reflecting itself. Right. So the community reflecting itself, the, the playback servers, the, the vendors started getting much better about, um, creating the ability to wind up, um, sharing information between stations. It's much easier now. It's not a file-based workflow. So I haven't pushed that idea about using the archive as sharing, but there are centers that do that, that wind up um, adjacent centers that wind up sharing the programs between the center by going up to the archive and then bringing it back down. Um, and that's, that's something that's, in terms of creative, that's really interesting to think about in terms of how you wind up showing the community there their information once it's on the the other thing is that once it's on the internet you've got you can bring in community members and people that have time if you don't have an, enough metadata about this particular community event that happened once it's up there and people know how to get to it they can wind up looking through these things and saying oh so you're involving the community members in adding the missing metadata and enriching the metadata of that particular event that's something um Somerville, Massachusetts had a film festival in the summertime. They would project these thing, these old videos on the side of their building uh, in the summertime. And it was a community celebration. Well, and I, and I think it's something I think is a, a kind of a vast potential of people that people should be thinking about is the ability for communities to understand themselves through, through memory, which very often is something that, um, I think must be created by the community members themselves. And that includes the representations uh, of our collective life. And you know, just as uh, a speaker earlier today talked about uh, in, in a really kind of a poetic way that sort of that, that memory of, of history, place and locality has to be something, you know, can be something that's co-created. So I think it's a, a, a potential there to be able to use those resources to be able to do that local creation as well. So, uh, and John, any, any final thoughts on as our, our time is, is, yeah. is wrapping up here? Yeah, one more thing. The, the archive in association with the Institute for Museum and Library Studies has a multi-year grant for community web. Uh, they call it community webs. And it's basically this, it's, it's um, uh, web-based um, community memories and they accept um, you know, contact the archive about about this program because there's funding for it. They accept a cohort of 15 to 20 organizations um, on an annual or, or uh, twice a year, uh, sorry, every other year basis. And so that's something that's a method uh, that's something that may be useful. Um, I have a bunch of different um, one pagers or two one or two pagers. Um, the first page is I've distributed to the BAVAC and to the NEA folks that, that are hosting this, and it's a build your own adventure. There are links in there, and you can eventually find your way to um, more information about my project, and um, it answers it, it would answer a lot of questions. Um, I, also, my email is jhauser 
J-H-A-U-S-E-R at P.O. Box.com. And folks can contact me directly. Well, John, I appreciate uh, you joining us, and I appreciate that the power hasn't gone out up there. Yeah. Power outages that uh, in Eureka. Uh, so uh, I'm right. glad uh, that uh, not just the internet, but also electricity held up during the course of our conversation. So thanks for joining us here today. Well, thank you. This was an amazing uh, introduction to an amazing bunch of people. I'm glad to know that these uh, these collaborations and conversations are happening. Thanks, folks. Don, let me send it back to you. Sure. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, John. Wow. Um, really a big, giant appreciation. Um, I, I feel like these two discussions uh, really so, were so uh, and powerful and reflective. I'm in kind of awe of the work and the questions the work um, brings to us. Um, I do love that idea of the community, that community member, mem that community memory can be created and shared together um, that um, and that this is uh, the work that we're we're talking about here today. Um, obviously, we know that this work is really, really more important than ever. Um, we know that uh, this is memory as well as historical evidence of our community's experiences. It's critical for our dialogue around the past, present, and future. And we know that protecting and creating these ways to ensure the fidelity, which is a lot of <laughs> around what we're talking about, as well as the integrity, um, you know, supports the understanding of truth, memory, meaning, and justice in our society. So profound. Um, recently, I just, I, I just want to thank both panels and moderators. I mean, like, seriously, big round of applause. If people want to put hearts and love up on the reactions um, for both groups. Um, really beautiful, um, amazing group of people doing really important work. Um, thank you. Uh, I, before we move to like the last session, section, I um, there was recently an open letter from the Archival Producers Alliance that was published in an article in the Hollywood Reporter. We'll put that in the in the chat and definitely all the links and things from the chat will be shared with everyone. You know, following the big um, union strikes that happened, um, you know, part of what they were asking for was for the field, the, you know, media, film, arts, um, to pay attention to the use and misuse of AI um, and in terms of scrubbing media and using that and creating new things, right? And this request, so there's a request from archivists around the country. Um, and just to quote the article briefly, it's time for the industry to establish standards in response to the new technology so that trust with our viewers will remain unbroken. Um, this is what's in the open letter of this newly established Archival Producers Alliance. The alliance is made up of over 100 documentarians that include Emmy and Oscar winning filmmakers who've worked across studios and streamers. So I really encourage people to look at this, check out what they're saying. Um, I think there's a place to sign if you want to, if you're an archivist and you want to do that. Um, we really want to keep these conversations going. Um, we know how this impacts our work in media, arts, technology, and education. Um, and now we're going to turn to our open mic section. Uh, we have a few folks um, with some great news to share with you. Uh, and for future meetings, if you want to be listed in this announcement group, um, let us know before the meeting and we'll add you to the queue. Uh, so first up, um, Joshua Sternfeld from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Let us know what's the good news, <laughs> Joshua. Thanks. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks to Jax and uh, the IMAG group for, uh, for inviting me here today. Uh, it was truly inspiring uh, to see all of the wonderful projects that are happening, all of the, the amazing organizations. Um, and I guess one of the underlying themes um, for a lot of uh, a lot of these efforts is is there funding out there? And so I'm here on behalf of the National Endowment for the Humanities to say, yes, there is funds to preserve these wonderful collections. Uh, so my name is Joshua Sternfeld. I'm a senior program officer um, in our division of preservation and access. Uh, our division has quite a number of programs, but one of the longstanding interests that we've had uh, over many, many years is the preservation of audiovisual collections. 
uh, and it has certainly intersected th throughout those years with um, working with um, smaller institutions, arts organizations, um, small nonprofits, uh, like many of the uh, organizations represented here today. So um, I'm sort of going to cut to the end and say um, first and say that my contact information is in the chat. So if there's nothing that you walk away with um, uh, here today, it's that you can reach out to me. My email is there. Um, I've put the link to uh, our website that has a number of the grant programs that are probably of most interest in terms of archiving and preserving your, uh, your content. Um, and just to say, you know, sort of real quick point out a couple of the programs that um, probably should be on your radar, um, and which is to say that these programs um, serve a number of different um, purposes and needs um, in terms of preserving your content. So there's a little bit of um, trying to figure out what the best program is for you, but um, the easiest thing to do is to just reach out to me with your questions. So first, um, probably foremost for a lot of you is our Preservation Assistance Grants Program for smaller institutions. Um, this is a program that um, is intended to meet basic needs um, for um, really sort of foundational work for, for how to preserve your collections and, and sort of get that foothold that you need uh, to, to really begin the, the, the journey of preserving your, your content long term. So you can do various activities such as bringing a consultant to do a, a general preservation assessment. You can purchase basic archival supplies. Um, you can develop plans and policies. Uh, emergency preparedness, um, it, you, know, you can do some basic inventorying and basic training. Um, it really serves a, a quite a number of, of, of needs. Um, and I think you'll find um, this is a, a great starting point for, for um, um, a lot of the work that you might wanna get, um, get off the ground. Uh, a little bit sort of a sister program to that, um, uh, which we call PAG, uh, Sister Program to Preservation Assistance Grants, is what we call Sustaining Cultural Heritage Collections. Uh, so it's a little bit of a mouthful. Um, this is a bit more of a holistic program that is intended to serve your infrastructural needs um, for preserving your collections. Um, it's our green program. So we asked uh, that the activities you wanna undertake there um, uh, revamping your HVAC system, including new shelving and things of that sort, um, have a green or sustainable component to that. Um, one of our um, found, you know, cornerstone programs um, that we offer is uh, what we call humanities collections and reference resources. Um, this is um, this is our biggest program. It's intended to. Uh, serve um, a singular collection, but it can really do quite a lot of activities uh, within that program. Everything from doing the basic indexing work that you might need to do with your, your AV content all the way up to uh, digitizing and, and making uh, uh, that material more accessible long term. And finally, I think there is a program that would also should also be on your radar. It's our newer program. It's called Cultural and Community Resilience. So um, this is a program that came out of our, our new American Tapestry Initiative. It's intended to, um, I think of it as our uh, documentation program. Um, it's intended for uh, communities to um, work with uh, various preservation organizations, other kinds of local organizations, media, community media or organizations to document um, your community, particularly uh, those that are um, under threat uh, due to climate change or have um, experienced um, uh, or are intended to document the COVID-19 or a pandemic experience. Um, so that's a lot uh, to digest in two minutes, um, but please email me or visit our website and you can find out more information about all those programs. So thank you. Great, thank you so much. Our next up is Abby Sun from the International Documentary Association. Thanks, Don. Thanks, everybody at BayFAC. Thanks, Jax. Um, I've been attending these meetings since the pandemic, so it's kind of amazing to see um, so many familiar faces and to hear about everything that's happening. I took a lot of notes during the last presentation because our archives are also on YouTube, so there is a lot that we need to address. Um, I'm here as the Director of Artist Programs from IDA, the International Documentary Association. Every other year, we have our big event, um, a biannual conference by and for documentary filmmakers. I see lots of folks representing documentary filmmakers here. Some folks we've asked to come to the conference as well. I hope to see you there. 
And for those who don't know, we really see this as a special space um, that's really for gathering and for discussing the big issues that can't find a place uh, in more market-oriented or festival-oriented spaces where you're being dragged from meeting to meeting, so on and so forth. Our themes this year are essentially distribution and access. It's networks, strategy and access. And we're thinking really broadly about all of these terms and, and how they get expressed and how it is that we're even putting on the conference. Uh, the shout out to the Archival Producers Alliance, for example, they will be presenting draft guidelines for putting guardrails around um, generative AI use in documentary. And we'll be speaking with some representatives from some um, powerful players about how they can be partners in enforcing proposed guidelines. Um, so we're talking conversations at that scale, the future in AI. We're also talking conversations about kind of the more the more local um, things that include um, why, why do we, and I see some Sundance folks here, so apologies for calling out Sundance in this way, but why does Sundance take so much space in our imagination and in how we conceive of being a part of the documentary industry and our ecosystem? What does that mean for all of the players in the system, whether you're a filmmaker or you're an institutional representative? Um, so I'm not going to speak too much. The conference is coming up. It's going to be April 15th through 18th. Um, it's going to be in person in LA, in Little Tokyo, which we love as a historic arts district. It will also be virtual. Um, and, um, you know, in the face of all arts nonprofits suffering massive budget cuts, I will just say I fought tooth and nail to preserve the live streaming and the virtual components of getting real at the conference. Because, I mean, one of our themes is access. We have to preserve that. Um, and it's it kind of thinking about what it is that we say we value and how do we actually express that? Those are the things that I'm really, really um, interested in, 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 in kind of modeling, not that we're perfect, um, modeling and expressing. Um, so it will be available um, virtually and then also for everybody. If you register for the conference, um, you will get a chance to um, watch most of the events, which will be live streamed and then um, recorded and posted uh, asynchronously for the month afterwards. And then we're planning on putting things on YouTube after that, but I guess we'll see where we're going to put things now. Um, I will say um, in terms of also financial access, you can email us at conference at documentary.org at any time, no excuses needed. We're happy to give out complimentary virtual passes to people. In person does have, you know, hard costs associated. So unfortunately I don't have complimentary passes for that. I'm going to drop a whole bunch of stuff in chat now, including my email address. I will send out discount codes to the IMAG mailing list immediately after this call. So you don't need to copy and paste anything out of chat immediately. And for being at this meeting, I'm giving you a special sneak preview of our program announcement, which is coming out tomorrow. I just ask that you don't, feel free to share this with your colleagues. I just ask that you don't um, post it online <laughs> before we actually announce it tomorrow. But if you want to know more in depth what we've been working on, that's there. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much. I'm so excited about that conference. Yay. And speaking of film festivals, where you have uh, Barbara Twist, who's going to share a little bit um, from the Film Festival Alliance. Thank you so much, Sean. Um, and yes, uh, co-signing the IDA conference, um, Film Festival Alliance will be there uh, talking about our accessibility scorecard and the impact report that's come out of that um, later this month, which we're very excited about, as well as um, uh, talking about an economic impact and audience reach study that we've been participating um, that is being led by Carrie Putnam um, through Harvard Shorenstein Center. Um, and so we're enthusiastic to show up there. And then our conference um, is happening in June. It's June 25th to the 28th. It's co-presented by Film Festival Alliance, which focuses on festivals and the people who run them, and Art House Convergence, which focuses on art house cinemas and community-based mission-driven um, you know, cinema operations, whether that's pop-ups, bricks and mortar space, museums, galleries, that sort of thing. Um, and so we've combined forces uh, to do a 
a redux of a conference that we used to participate in uh, back before the pandemic. So this one is fresh. It's going to be in Chicago. It'll be four days. Um, it is primarily for film festivals, um, people who work in the film festival industry, movie theaters, you know, art houses, seasonal workers, full-time workers. Um, a lot of us are nonprofit, so there's a lot of conversation around that. Um, we'll also have film distributors, and we have a number of archives coming, um, and other people kind of just generally in the independent film exhibition ecosystem. Some of the sessions and workshops that we'll be doing, um, we are bringing in Kareem Ahmad of Restoring the Future to do a, a deep workshop into curatorial justice and how you practice your programming values. Um, similarly, we'll be doing workshops on bringing in, um, you know, how you bring your uh, values into practice with operation. So that often shows up in staff well-being. Um, that kind of coincides with some of the data and surveying that we've been doing on wage and compensation in our field, um, which will be presented at the conference. Um, you know, we're going to be doing more in-depth look at the economic impact of our field. So both festivals and movie theaters bring a lot of year-round tourism dollars and hospitality dollars to our communities looking at ways that we can amplify that and understand that, um, you know, best practices on accessibility. Um, it sort of differs whether it's a, you know, a one, you know, kind of standalone event like a film festival or a bricks and mortar space, but um, that's definitely something that we are working on addressing field wide. And then a lot of other things, right? Like fundraising, succession planning. Um, that's, a really big one that I'm very excited to talk about because uh, it almost never gets talked about with nonprofits. Um, you know, marketing dollars, customer acquisition, really just um, all the different elements that go into the independent film exhibition field. Um, so very excited to do that. Um, and then, um, yeah, just enthusiastic. I'm going to drop more info in here. Um, please reach out if you have any questions um, and hope to see a bunch of you there. Thanks. Thank you so much, Barbara. That's great. And um, just a reminder, we will send you the, the chat and the notes and the links and stuff, but get, grab what you can if you don't want to wait that long. And Tim Lake from our BayVac preservation team. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for uh, everyone for being here and all the great presentations. It's been really cool to hear about everything. Uh, my name is Tim Lake. I'm the co-director of preservation at Bayback Media. Um, I'm going to drop my email here. Uh, I just wanted to shout out a couple things that we're working on. Um, and the first of all is the Preservation Access Program, um, which is an annual NEA funded initiative to offer subsidized digitization services to individual collection holders and small to medium sized organizations. I know there are maybe some uh, past grantees on this on this meeting right now. Um, applications are currently open um, and they're open through the rest of this week, though I think I'm gonna extend them into next week. So if anyone on this call wants to apply, um, it should be open until the middle of next week. And I will post the link here. I think that was already posted earlier, but here's the link again. And also, I just wanted to shout out a um, a new development at our uh, San Francisco office in San, uh, at Ninth Street. Uh, we've been developing a community preservation station that is loosely based on the popular public library media lab model uh, for providing do-it-yourself preservation resources to the local San Francisco community. Uh, in which community members can learn about preservation hardware and software while pr uh, providing uh, preserving their own personal memories. Uh, so it's just a really accessible, low cost, if no cost at all, um, option for our local community to take part in preservation. That's it. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Thanks a lot. Um, next up is um, uh, Kaylin Salander, who's going to talk a little bit about research that we're doing. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, I'm Kaylin Salander. I am also with Bayback with just a second opportunity from us. 
because the Bayback Media Preservation team and I are currently working on a nationwide initiative called Mapping the Magnetic Media Landscape, um, which is a study to assess where we're at as a collective um, in the, the country, where we're at with um, AV magnetic, magnetic Media Preservation. Um, so if I'm sure as many of you are on this call, if you're knowledgeable or of or responsible for the care and preservation of analog AV material, we really need your support by taking our survey that we have open right now. Your voice is so important to us and we really want to collect um, information from as many people as possible so we can use that to collectively address our greatest needs. Um, just also want to shout out Josh and the National Endowment for the Humanities for um, supporting this project and really believing that all of us need this information together to move forward. Um, so we are super grateful to give you a little preview about what the questions are going to ask about. It should only take you 20 to 30 minutes. It's going to ask about your role, the archive you work with and its audience, um, the training that you and your colleagues have access to. Um, as well as your organization's digitization workflows and your policies. It doesn't matter where you're at in the digitization process. It doesn't matter where you're at in the country. You can definitely take the survey. We're looking for organizations of all different sizes um, and structures and all of that. Um, so yeah, the purpose is really to develop an expansive data-driven understanding of the field of analog audiovisual material digitization and conservation across the US. Um, so yeah, the resulting data will be used to identify and respond to our greatest challenges um, in the changing field of AV preservation. And we are so excited about it. I also want to just shout out the, um, the information that you get after you take the survey. So once you are a respondent, you get to join an Ask Bayback Preservation Anything session. So it's where all the respondents and community members get to come together. You can ask us your toughest technical question and we'll all chat together through it. Um, so we're gonna offer several of those sessions. You can meet your fellow survey respondents and I'm gonna go ahead and put all of the information in the chat, but please share it widely, take it for you in your archive um, and yeah, share it with everyone you know. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, Avril, Clayton, tell us about America, Save America's Treasures. Hi everyone, I'm Avril Clater, Media Arts Specialist at the National Endowment for the Arts, and I wanted to put another federal funding opportunity on your radar that's relevant to today's field meeting focus. Um, this opportunity is called Save America's Treasures. Uh, it's administered by the National Park Service in partnership with the Institute of Museum and Library Services, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the NEA. And the grant focuses on historic preservation and collections grants, which could be relevant to this group because it includes the preservation of archival media collections. The grants do require a one-to-one -one match and range from $25,000 to $750,000. Applications are reviewed for demonstrated historical significance, the severity of the threat to the collection, and the quality and feasibility of the applicant's threat mitigation plan. Eligible applicants include nonprofit organizations, units of local government, educational institutions, and federally recognized tribes. The next deadline is planned for December of this year, and although that deadline is a ways away, I'm going to drop a link to the opportunity page for more information. Great, thank you so much. Up next is Gabriel uh, Capolino. Um. I get that right, Gab. Thank you so much. Thrilled to be here for the first time, seeing so many familiar um, faces, name boxes. Uh, I'm here uh, as director of International of the Gotham Film and Media Institute to, um, here's in the chat my name and my contact, to flag one of our latest deadlines coming up at the organization, which is the one for the uh, Come Producers Network, um, which we partner every year on to send up to to seven mid-career experience producers uh, from the United States to experience the uh, Can Marche and the uh, programming of the Producers Network, which runs in the first half of the Camping Festival. And it's a great opportunity for people to uh, meet as many peer-to-peer -peer producers from all over the world, but also get access to uh, the ecosystem of the Marche and the uh, buyers at the film festival. 
um i am putting also the link to the page in our website where the application form is in it uh the deadline is as i was saying really coming up tomorrow a uh, little spoiler and secret we are not closing it right away we're going to close it on friday at 12 noon est uh so still time eventually to get those applications in and send me questions of course if you have uh share it with your uh peers and groups of producers and uh and yeah feel free to ask also any questions to me via email it's an exciting program and uh, we're always honored to be there and send producers that are starting their global career and thinking outside the box uh, compared to what just the methodologies of doing movies in the US are uh, and a great opportunity to really network and create a peer to peer uh, network of producers from all over the world. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. That sounds very exciting. Um, Paula, I think you're going to tell us a little bit about the next conversation. Yes, thank you, Dawn. Thanks, everyone. Uh, so just wanted to say super quick, um, with the women's over 40 group, um, we so appreciated the enthusiasm um, and interest in that topic and big props to Wendy Levy and the Alliance for facilitating our first session. We are going to schedule the next one very soon. So for people that are interested in that topic, please uh, stay tuned. And then um, we're also going to be talking about uh, developing kind of a, a smaller group format for follow on conversation about preservation and archiving. And Rachel and I from EMEA will be um, talking about that and following up as well. Um, so thank you. That's all I got. Great. Thanks so much. So we're wrapping up at, uh, at the whatever, 1.30, 4.30. So I'm going to do final thank yous to everybody. Thank you to all of our guests. Thank you to the organizing committee. Thank you to everybody who's been here and you're paying attention and all just these incredible conversations. Please keep them going. Please offer ideas to us at IMAG for other conversations. Use the listserv. Um, the next meeting, save the date, is Wednesday, May 1st um, of this year. So, And we already know that we're going to have a presentation from Color Congress and Sahar Driver. So we're super excited about that and to hear about the amazing work that they've been doing. Um, uh, set Sign up on our listserv for registration and remember um, those links. Remember that this is a network for everyone supporting the field in all of the different roles that you have. Um, so that will be shared in the link. Um, please, um, if you're going to generate um, uh, discussions on the list serve, um, you know, offer, offer up what you want to do, um, and make sure that you're using that, um, well, and then at the end of this meeting, we have an open lobby. So for those of you who'd like to stick around, um, and have a conversation, uh, we are, are doing that next. And I don't know if there's anything else about the lobby. The lobby will just go for a few minutes. You know, we'll try and keep it open for a little bit, maybe like 10 minutes or something like that. Anybody else, anyone else? But thank you all for being here. Thanks everybody for, for making this happen. Have a great day.